Okay, folks. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Joey Coppage. I'm the fertility nutrition coach. Uh, for us humans, the end goal of staying alive has motivated our health choices for, for most of our life, right? Uh, how to eat, how to exercise is curricula in most of our school upbringing. Uh, we fund our governments to promote public health amongst all of us, all of our fellow citizens. Uh, we view the ability to build muscle or lose weight as measures of self-worth and whether we admit it or not, uh, measures of other people's worth too. And our supermarkets are lined with food-like products that tell you right on the plastic wrapper if it's low-fat or gluten-free or high in protein. So we are a culture that champions health, right? Yet over the last 50 years, sperm quality has declined 50 to 60%. And we're more anxious, overfed, yet undernourished, and less mobile virtually than ever. Just as notably, we are surrounded by more endocrine disrupting chemicals than we have ever been in history. So it's no wonder that the use of assisted reproductive treatments are increasing five or 10% every year. Our fertility faces more threats now than it ever has before. So today we're going to address it and we're gonna face it together. I'll introduce our, our panelists now. I'm joined by uh, three very generous guys here. Thank you for your, for your time today, guys. Dr. Ed Coates. Uh, is the first an obstetrics and gynecology uh, consultant and fertility <laughs> specialist working in Oxford and London. Uh, he's also the founder of Total Fertility, a platform that helps couples uh, on their assisted fertility journeys. The second guy uh, joined here with is Ian Stones, a leading UK fertility specialist based in Brighton and Hove. His holistic approach to fertility treatment looks uh, at improving oh. all areas uh, from physical to emotional. Uh, through practices of acupuncture, as well as coaching. And then finally, Morton Olstead, the co-founder and CEO of Exceed Health, the tech company at the forefront of at-home sperm testing. Testing is, of course, an integral part of understanding and improving all of our sperm health, uh, and Exceed is on a mission to make it easier than ever before. So let's dive right into it, you guys. Morton, let's start with you. Is all hope lost after I've painted that very grim, dark picture of our current state of affairs? Is all hope lost for someone who finds out that there's something abnormal about their sperm or can it be turned around? Uh, yeah, so no, all hope is certainly not lost. So the first thing to do is to, first of all, know what is the status, right? So that's why we have a very strong focus on you know, early awareness, early diagnosis, early referral, early treatment, if you do go down a, a treatment path. Um, that's why, you know, we have also developed a quite advanced uh, at-home sperm testing uh, product and service. So you can actually get something tested early because the earlier you found out, uh, find out there may be an underlying issue, the earlier you can either do a lifestyle intervention uh, about it um, so improve your lifestyle. I think we'll touch upon that or refer to medical treatment if it's an underlying, uh, you know, issue that, that should be cool. addressed. Yeah. I'm going to ask you more about that testing later. Sure. Thank you and welcome. Uh, by the way, everybody who is still joining, uh, feel free to pop some questions into the chat. Uh, we'll monitor those as we go, and uh, in the background, they might come in and interrupt me and ask a question or two, or we may just save them all until the very end. Um, you know, so give us a hand and help us scrape up the pieces that we've not answered uh, for you. Next up is Ian. Uh, Ian, have you seen anyone in your practice, uh, acupuncture or through coaching, um, who's been able to turn their sperm parameters around? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's kind of... Uh... That question of um, you know is all is all hope lost? I think you know what we're doing tonight with this and all the other kind of webinars and stuff that I've done with Exceed and other other kind of partners is is all about driving awareness around male fertility and raising that kind of profile and and that is really really positive. And yeah, I've I've worked with a lot of guys where some very simple interventions uh, have made a massive difference. And I think you know for me that. That's what I find so rewarding about working with men and working with sperm health is, you know, some very simple educational steps and very simple lifestyle processes, which we're going to cover tonight, I know, um, 
can have a massive difference, you know, and, you know, it's important that a guy gets tested and, and tests very early. I think, you know, me and Morton will be banging that drum a lot tonight about early testing. It's so, so important. Um, but, you know, one or two tests is, is your kind of baseline and that's your starting point. And then reviewing lifestyle and diet and you can get incredible changes. I've seen one guy, you know, uh, 8, million to 20, eight, 8 million to 24 million uh, sperm count in, in three months, you know, turn that round. And actually I found out this week that they've just had a successful IVF cycle. Um, you know, so everything that you, you know, there's so much you can do that will help shift the odds into your favor. Do we have to do all the things? It seems like such a, <laughs> a daunting task to do, you know, you, the, are, there are plenty of things that you can do, but does that mean that we have to check all those boxes off before making, no. uh, getting all these numbers back to where they're supposed to be? No, and I think, you know, I've worked with so many fertility clients over the years and, and I've seen it all where, you know, they're stressed up to their eyeballs because they're trying not to get stressed. So that's one thing, but they're doing, okay, they've cleared all the plastics. They've, they, you know, they're only eating X, Y, and Z. They've cut out alcohol. They're not having caffeine. And if they have a glass of wine, they feel horrendously guilty for weeks on end. Um, my view has always been kind of like an 80-20 rule. It's like, okay, if you can be 80% good, you know, 20% kind of slip is not the end of the world. And if if having a takeaway or a pizza or a glass of wine at the end of the week is, is your way of unwinding, then that's fine, you know? I think, you know, for a lot of guys that I've worked with, they're like, oh, I've been told I can't cycle, I can't drink beer, I can't have a coffee, I've got to walk around without any boxer shorts on all the time. And, and it gets a bit overwhelming. And I think kind of trying to give them some perspective and control and understand... You know, big big believer in kind of, in terms of knowledge is power. So actually, I think if you know if we improve the education for men and get them understanding why this stuff's important, why they should you know cut out the processed meats or whatever, then when you make you know you know all of this, Joe is a nutritionist. When when people understand stuff, they can make positive changes. It's when you're just told don't eat this, don't do that, and make sure you take your supplements. It's not well. I don't, I don't understand that. Why, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, knowledge, power, education, and then, you know, informed choices. And baby steps too. One thing at a time. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I like Just, to give it a, you, you mentioned the 80, 20, I like to call it the, the give ourselves 20% wiggle room. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause the fact of the matter is whether you want to or not, no matter how ambitious and how much of a perfectionist you may be uh, you're going to wiggle regardless. Mm. So if you allow yourself a certain amount, 20% is usually good uh you know you can you can wiggle and you can feel good about it instead of feeling uh, guilt or shame and ultimately stressed out about it yeah yeah definitely you gotta you gotta give so, yourself some slack i want to ask the three of you uh a quick fire question but i'm going to set it up first so the question will be in one word or one phrase uh what's one single change somebody can make today to protect themselves against these destructive endocrine disrupting chemicals that we're all um, newly afraid of. Um, so just a couple of facts to start things off. Uh, research shows that men exposed to certain plastics were 50 to 80% more likely to have impaired sperm motility and two and a half to 3.3 times more likely to have low sperm concentration. This is very just minimal, normal everyday plastic exposure. Uh, in a different study of couples using IVF, when men were exposed to the same plastics, uh, implantation rates were almost 80% lower in men who were exposed to those plastics. And then in yet another study, certain plastics uh, were associated with changes in sperm DNA that resulted in poor embryo quality and lower chances of implantation. So being exposed to these types of endocrine disrupting chemicals isn't just affecting sperm, it's also affecting sperm to the point where it's affecting embryo, right? So you're, you're going into a cycle, we're paying all this money. If you're already going into an assisted reproductive treatment, uh, only to find out later that something, some sort of chemical, you know, perhaps was the, was the source of a failure down the road. So back to the question, and we'll go through this for, um, uh, we'll st actually, let's start with you, Ian. What is, what's one word or phrase uh, that, you're, that you could use or one suggestion that somebody could change uh, today? Oh, so I was thinking, so, so I might try and go for six words, but as a phrase, and they would be, <laughs> phrase word. yeah, get tested, get educated, and get healthy, really. I think they're the three things, healthy being, you know, focusing on diet and lifestyle. Yeah. 
Morton, what about you? What is what is the the one phrase, however many words you want it to be, uh, as a suggestion for what to change? We know we should get tested, but what do we how do what do we change if we know something needs to change? Uh, well, you were alluding to the micro exposures, the BPAs and uh, PCBs and stuff like that. So my mm -hmm. suggestion in relation to that would be limit your exposure to plastics if you can. So plastic containers can be changed for metal ones or glass containers if it's in contact with, with food and ingestibles. Okay, cool. And Ed, we haven't heard from you yet, but thank you for being patient with me. I'm circling back to you now because I'm gonna ask you to also expand uh, on, your, on your one word or phrase suggestion. But what's your one, your one suggestion or one change you think people could make to limit their exposure? I think six words, um, 90 days is all it takes. It, it, you know, men are, <clears throat> we're sperm factories, ultimately, you know, we are producing sperm all the time. Sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we're not very good at it. And I think what you've talked about there is, is so true. The evidence is growing around plastics, you know, and there's been so many studies in the last sort of 10 years in this area. It's, I mean, it's interesting that first statistic you started with around 50% drop in sperm concentration count since 1970, that that work um, by Shana Swan and then more recently Levine's paper in 2017 has shown this drastic decline and there must be something greater at play here. Of course, we're looking at sperm tests, which have been around since the 1950s. We're still looking at the same parameters and to many men, actually, they're, they're actually normal. They look OK, but they're still not conceiving and there's unexplained fertility and then there's failed IVF cycles. So there is something going on. And I think it's a really important area of this. And it, it, for me, uh, it's really important that men understand that it, it, unlike the girls where it can be harder, where you're born with all your eggs, you're like a sort of an egg warehouse, all of your eggs are used up through your life. Men are always producing sperm. And if the ingredients are right in our bodies, um, 90 days is all it takes. You might see that change if you get yourself tested. These, these EDCs, we'll refer to them uh from now on, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Mm -hmm. EDCs, they're found in packages that our food come in. Uh, they're found in our cleaning products, in our under our sink where all of our cleaning stuff is, um, all the stuff that's in our bathroom, like all the things we use in our hair, we rub on our skin, put on our face, in our shaving cream. Yeah. Um, and even stuff in our, in our yard, right? All the fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides and bug spray and um, it, uh, there's, there's just stuff everywhere. Uh, even the water that comes out of your water hose is a plastic water hose. It's, you know, the same, same chemicals, uh, same chemical families anyway. So it really is kind of everywhere, which on the surface seems like, holy shit, I need to put myself in a bubble, right? Is that how <laughs> I protect myself? And the answer is like, actually, no, because a medical bubble is going to have a lot of these EDCs as well. Um, but going back to where we sort of started off, if, I guess, I guess in my opinion, if I were to change one thing today, it would be choosing a space where, where I could, where I could start making changes, right? Don't try to change it all because you're just not going to be able to, sorry, you live in 2021, but if you're going to choose, is it my kitchen? Is it my bathroom? Is it my, um, is it my yard? Uh, is it the kid's playroom, right? Which space can I start to kind of take over? Um, and start to change from there. Do any of you have any suggestions on, okay, once I'm there, how do I know what has a lot of chemical exposure coming from it? And how do I, how do I go about finding good alternatives? I mean, I think the microplastics um, data is emerging, isn't it? We're seeing more and more studies that suggesting that this is a really big thing for men. And it's, it's the silent effect that it's having. We don't know it, it's there every day and everything we do. Um, and, and as I go back to that 90 day thing, you know, if you could just change that environment for 90 days to see if things improve, then it's not a big part of our lives. And, and, and often patients will say to me, but, you know, I, friends who've got one or two or three children and they do this and that. And, and I think my message to, to people listening is, is that if you're the one that's struggling with fertility, it's really important that you dedicate your and become disciplined at, at the, these really important areas microplastics is, is emerging there's been a lot of work around it in animals and it's coming now more in, in mammalian study, studies as, you, as you've alluded to so i think being really strict and disciplined around the water bottles you're drinking from the containers you're using um and not just being um not just not just ignoring it and i think this is only going to come with better education better awareness um 
for men. And, and actually that discipline is only for 90 days to see if it makes a change. Um, because as we know, you know, sperm turnover is that quick. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, I feel like we'll probably get a lot of questions about this. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let people's imaginations run a little wild, but Ed, while, you're, while we're with you, um, can we talk a little bit about one of the, uh, the second factor here is just sedentary lifestyle. Um, some yeah. factors obviously we can avoid, right? We can avoid pollution. We can avoid all the plastics that are out there in the world. But uh, other than that, you know, we can change things like how much we move and how we balance our energy in terms of the food that comes in and then the energy we, we use to, to, to use it all. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important as well to sort of say the importance of, of not having a, a too sedentary lifestyle. But I've always, um, you know, as a former athlete myself, um, was always quite concerned about extremes of anything. And I think if you're working at extremes, whether it's in sports um, or even in, in talking just now about pollutants and things like that, you know, if you're in an environment that's, that's extremes of anything, then you are more likely, I think, to suffer. And that certainly applies to exercise. There are many benefits to exercise, but I think we're all sort of straining for what, where is that homeostasis? Where is the right level to be doing? And I, 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 again, I, I really don't like lines in the sand. I think they're, they're difficult. They shouldn't really be drawn around things, but it's giving people a kind of a guide of maybe, you know, if, where we, what is too much? And again, it goes back to, if you're that patient that has parameters that are not normal, you need to look at those, those, those things. Um, so exercise routines, you know, we know this data around cycling, running, but as you say, if you're a keen cyclist and that is your main either mode of exercise or commuting for example to work to say you can't cycle is is really useless i think to a person on the other end of the uh, consultation phone you know remotely as we're all doing now you need to have a bit more understanding of why it, why that problem is there and actually can you moderate that how can you look at changing that how can you build that in so you don't become sedentary but you build it in so you still get the enjoyment of those exercise routines you do but it's about keeping it all in with a modicum of sort of moderation i suppose um so for me um it, it's about learning about the extremes and and then you know personally as, as an ian said there as well i, I remember very well uh, a very keen cyclist you know who, who i saw many years ago who was doing sort of over 200 miles a week on his bike and actually he just dialed it down he didn't dial it down to the point that he didn't do any cycling so it wasn't a sort of zero <clears throat> cycling input it, it was it was sort of maybe a 30 percent decrease and he saw things improve and we talked around lots of other issues it, it, we all like in life to hang our you know our coat on one peg but it's it's normally more than one factor is the honest truth um, and I think for men, it's important to understand what all of those factors are, which is what comes with the education and what we're talking about tonight, but also understanding that actually exercise can be good for us as well. It's not all bad, but just looking at your own habits um, it is really key. Um, and discipline is absolutely it's so, so crucial to making those changes. If you're the one that is in the in the dock, if you like, who's, who's the one being analysed and sort of your, your parameters are the ones that are being sort of scrutinized by the clinics and by the, by the, by your partners, perhaps looking at, you know, what your parameters are. Right. So it's, it's funny. I feel like the people who are listening are in either one of two camps, either they're like you who may be working out too much. It's perhaps could be a problem. And then there's the other people who are like me, who are like working out too much is literally never going to be a problem for me. Right? <laughs> I hate I hate going to the gym, um, but like you're saying, you know, it doesn't need to be, you know, if you are an avid cyclist or you are an avid, you know, gym rat, as we like to call them, uh, it doesn't mean that your only other option is to go sit on the couch and that's it, right? At the same time, if you're like me, in getting more exercise and finding some balance doesn't necessarily mean I need to become an, Olymp an Olympic champion, right? I just need to like do 10% more than what I'm doing now, because it's really more about just movement, right? Giving your body something to, uh, an opportunity to sort of use the nutrients that you're giving it, would you say, uh, just to, 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 to find that balance? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data that suggests that, you know, men with reduced sperm parameters, there is a complete link to that and comorbidities and, and mortality. So, you know, we're seeing that um, the, the men that you'll see with these reduced parameters, this is very much rule of thumb, uh, you know, as a whole, will tend to have more underlying health concerns and other, and other issues, whether that's obesity or other concerns. And that isn't always true for every person, 
but it's important, I think, to understand that there is a link to general health as well and sperm parameters. So it's getting that big picture view and not trying to focus too much on just one thing, because I'm, I think that's that's dangerous. I think it's important to think of all those factors, but but also be kind to yourself. Don't give yourself too much of a hard time. You know, if you go to yeah. the gym, you may not it may not be going to the gym that's actually causing you the problem. It might be the fact that you, you know, you, you drink out of a, you know, we talk about microplastics. It, it may be that that's really the thing for you. So it's changing, taking it step by, by step, looking quite carefully at it, um, but but also not putting your stress levels up. And I know we're going to talk about stress as well, but because that it can get very stressful and quite lonely for men in this space. Yeah. I think, I think yeah, that message cool. of balance is is so important. And, and I love what you said there about, about that, Ed, because, you know, so my background being kind of Chinese medicine before I kind of got really into male fertility coaching, you know, we talk a lot about balance and that, and that balance of energy and kind of you know, living by the seasons. And, and I've seen it as well in, in clinic, like those extremes of, of people. And it's okay, right, you know, get that you really enjoy going for your run or you enjoyed in your, your spinning classes and your high impact stuff. But actually, can we take two of those workouts and put into yoga sessions instead? So people still get a bit of what they love, but they also then have something that's a bit more restorative and a bit more, a bit more kind of calming. But I think, you know, it's that idea of actually, the, and, and you alluded to this thing earlier, Joe, it's not an all or nothing thing. You haven't got to be all, all healthy, all fantastic, all exercising, all perfect all of the time. It's actually, okay, let's find a good balance. And, you know, I'm, I'm in your camp, Joe. It's like, you, know, you won't be finding me in a gym uh, any, anytime, <laughs> anytime soon or before I die, probably. Um, <laughs> but but you know I, i'd actually quite happily go out for a nice walk you know that, that's good for me so if you've got somebody who's very sedentary you know what are the simple easy little wins and the very gentle easy changes you know the, mm -hmm. i love the principle and the concept of the compound effect you know the the idea of putting you know a pound away in the bank every single day or every week you know mm -hmm. over a long period of time that has a really positive effect and if people can just start making a change if that's one extra glass of water a day, if that's, um, you know, I know you, you hear it a lot on kind of sort of healthcare things like, can you get off the bus one stop early or, or actually do you need to take the tube through London or actually, cause it's mm. not as far as you think it is to walk. How can you change right. simple daily habits that will start having such a positive effect? You know, you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, making a small, making one small change that ends up uh, leading to a bigger, bigger change, right? Something that a lot of us have experienced over the past year and a half is we didn't realize how much movement our bodies were getting until we were forced to not move them at all, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that at the same time, you know, we're also uh, blending back into whatever version of normal life is now which for a lot of us is kind of a, a lot of the same. It's a lot of the same, just uh, maybe a lot of us are, are working from home or even if we are working elsewhere, there's not a lot of things you can go out and do as much as there were before. Um, so, you know, you can, there's, there's, there's the, you can compound that activity onto itself, but what about for those of us who are finding ourselves, you know, maybe I was active before, but now I just really don't go anywhere or do anything because I work at home and I stay at home and I, I, I do nothing. What's, what's something that you can do if you, that's not like your typical go to the gym or go for a run that could potentially uh, warrant that compound effect? I, you know, I think kind of one of the simple things is stand up, get a stand up desk or get, get some kind of simple way to, you know, I certainly I've spent to various different clients uh, and where they've said, OK, well, when I've got a meeting and I want a phone call, I stand up, you know, or you could uh, walk around the house whilst you're on the meeting. You know, um, if you've got the choice of a toilet downstairs or a toilet upstairs, you know, when it's when it's time to go, why don't you go for the one upstairs and run up the stairs and run back down, you know, Um I just think, you know, really simple little things like that. But I think actually, you know, the whole working from home thing has been really, um, I think in, in some ways it's been, it's been hugely beneficial because people have, have found that they've got time to, for, for an evening or whatever. But also it's actually meant that work has crept into that time a lot more. And people are just like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm at my desk at eight and they're there through to eight o'clock in the evening and they don't get up and they don't eat. And it's like, you know, make sure you block out your time for a lunch mm -hmm. break. And 
Or, you know, another really good little thing that, that quite a few of my clients have done or I've encouraged them to do is that have a commute to work. So you might be working from home, but actually walk out your front door, walk around the block for 15, 20 minutes, and then come back in and start your day's work. And I tell you what, you'll find you're so much more productive and so much more focused rather than sliding down out of your pajamas and, and down to your desk and kind of with a coffee next to you. It's, you know, setting up good, sensible, healthy routines and sticking to them is just fantastic in terms of productivity, health, well-being, mental health, and fertility as well. But it's so much easier to just not. <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? But then you've got to connect with what what's the impact of not doing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And what is the why of even caring in the exactly. first place? I was reading, I was reading a book. Uh, if you've ever heard of the book, um, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Oh, I have thought about that. I haven't got that yet. Maybe I'll make that one. It came out book. like uh, maybe like eight years ago at this point. But then he wrote uh, the second book, which was it's everything is fucked, <laughs> which is, although it doesn't sound like it, it's a book about hope. Uh, and it's the point is that, you know, we sort of live in a nihilistic world where we kind of, you know, things look like they're kind of crumbling around us and not everything is all that great. And the world's coming to an end in 30 years anyways, at least it seems that way. Uh, so it kind of seems like this existence, right? If you think about it too much, uh, if you don't get up and walk around, you start thinking about it too much that this existence we have is just sort of futile. It's all for nothing. We're kind of just as little pieces of sand on a little blue speck in the middle of nothing. And that's nihilistic. And the point that, you know, he's trying to make, I'm only halfway through it, uh, is that, you know, yeah, that all, all that stuff might be true. And you really are kind of insignificant and the day, you, the, the day that comes that you'd end up dying, uh, for the most part, most people in the world are not going to know anything that you've done or care. But there's a reason that we do things we do. There's a reason that people climb to the top of Mount Everest. There's a reason that people you know, work their asses off and pay their life savings and do all of this crazy testing and you know, for women, uh, invasive surgeries to do this uh, you know, IVF or to do anything, you know, assisted is, by the way, guys, really tough on, on, the, on the women. Um, and the reason we do it is because we have hope. We hope that there will be an outcome at the end, right? Um, so, you know, obviously that's a really uh, philosophical way of saying like, when you get yourself into that slump of like, I really don't have to get up from this desk because this is what pays my bills, to be honest. You kind of have to remember, well, why are you worried about any of the shit you're worried about in the first place, right? Why are you worried about being on this webinar right now? Why are you worried about paying all this money to help you start your family? It's because there's an end result that is motivating you to do all of this. So let that exact same motivation be your reason to just get up and walk around for five, for five minutes. Because if it's five minutes, that's five minutes more than zero minutes that you may have spent yesterday. And it's really, it's really gotta be, we really gotta take these really microscopic looks at, at these kinds of changes. Yeah, and, and, and as, as Ed said, I think, you know, you gotta remember there's a, there's a strong correlation between subfertility and, you know, other morbidities, I think was, was the word you used, but you know. Yeah, other, other health concerns here, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's, you know, that's another factor that you might be sitting there in that slump feeling sorry for yourself and, and thinking, oh, what's the right. point? And, oh, okay, my, you know, my sperm samples stuff and, and you know, what can I do about it? It's not just about that, it is about the rest of your life as well. And, and everything that you can put in place to improve, improve your sperm health will improve your overall health as well. Well, it's, it's a big, gonna... long, it's a big wide web, right? There's, we talked about the, the, the chemicals that could possibly be causing a, a problem. Uh, we talked about, we're talking about exercise now. Um, obviously, any, our bodies were meant to move. But another huge part of this web is, is nutrition, diet, a diet and lifestyle, right? So uh, I'm going to take the reins here a little bit and, and talk about what I do um, for, for a living. So when we think about what is, how does nutrition really help us is that, is it really just sort of a, a, a lovely flu flu nice to have, or is it really freaking necessary? And the reality is the reason that any of us are still sitting here today is because we ate food. If we didn't eat food, we just wouldn't live. The point of it is just to keep us alive. And unfortunately, 
whenever we get to this point in our lives when we're trying to reproduce and make another version of ourselves, um, what we've been doing to stay alive so far often isn't good enough. And that's kind of the uncomfortable truth of it all. So let's think about it in the most like narrowed down way possible. What nutrients specifically do we actually use to produce lots of healthy, normal, mobile, chromosomally normal sperm? What are, what are the things, what are the ingredients we're actually using? And the answer is um, polyunsaturated fats and essential fatty acids are, are, a, huge, are a huge thing. Most of the um, uh, cell membrane of the sperm, the sperm cell membrane is made of, of, of fatty acids and we need the right ones to not compete for space there. Vitamins and minerals, right? That's a very vast uh, array of different vitamins and minerals that we use to, to literally create sperm and all of the, produ the, uh, the production process that leads up to it. Uh, antioxidants to, to protect the sperm, which is a cell, right? Antioxidants are something we get from food that plants use to protect themselves from the sun and from oxygen, right? We use those things. Uh, we've learned over millions of years how to use those things uh, to protect our own cells from oxidative stress uh, and to protect our DNA as well, which is obviously important for reproducing humans. Uh, fiber is another thing we get from food, prebiotics from fiber that help to, uh, you know, bolster our immune system. Uh, and then of course, you know, water. So those are the really big things that, what are the big nutrients if you really want to know what's, what's most important are those, are those things. So it kind of seems like a simple, easy way, right? To sort of figure out, let me, how do I get most of those things? The question then sort of leads you to, what, what does a typical diet look like for someone who's got impaired sperm parameters. And so we look, you know, you can look at uh, collections of different studies and the common denominators, the characteristics or dietary traits of someone who has impaired uh, sperm parameters, whether that be one or all, are things like intake of, uh, or excessive intake of omega-6s, uh, right? So pro-inflammatory foods, um, intake of trans fats. You get these from a lot of like, you know, packaged baked goods, fried foods, anytime you're eating at a restaurant, even if they say it's a healthy restaurant, it's, you didn't cook it, so you don't know. A uh, high intake of red and processed meat, a uh, high intake of uh, sweet drinks and um, snacks, right? Lots of sweets, they're easy, they're delicious, they're right in our face. It's impossible to keep track of really how much we're actually having in comparison to what we need. And then on the flip side, we're not getting enough fish. We're not getting enough fiber, minerals, vitamins. Um, we're not getting enough uh, fruits and vegetables. We're not getting enough nuts and seeds right. or whole grains. Um, and, you know, put it all together, just for the most the part, even food. though we may not be getting enough of the micronutrients, right, a lot of the fuel and raw materials that we actually need, at the same time, what we are getting plenty of is calories, right? So you know, you've got foods that can be thought of as empty calorie foods. So we're eating a lot of, we're, we're getting plenty of food, um, but we're not getting a lot of value out of it, or a lot of nutrition. Uh, at the same time, because we're eating a lot of food and then living the way we were just describing, which is not getting a lot of exercise and really just not moving quite enough, um, even if it's just chores or taking your dogs on a walk, it creates this hypercaloric diet where you know, you're well-fed and you're nourished, but you're just, you're not doing what your body is used to doing um, or has been doing over millions of years to, to sort of to burn off that energy or to use that energy. Now, science and our governing bodies um, have been selling nutrition to us in this way for a really long time, right? By reducing our nutritional needs down to like finite numbers of like isolated nutrients. You need this much protein, this much fat, this much vitamin A, blah, blah, blah. But it's not really practical for us to think of food that way, right? It's just not practical. Um, what's uh, the takeaway that you should take, right? If you can erase everything I just said, what you should really write down in your notebook right now really would be, you need more fruits and vegetables. You need more nuts and seeds. You need more whole grain and fiber. You need more fish and seafood if you eat meat. Um, if you ate only the simple foods, right, that we just listed, if you ate just, if you just ate or focused on, on those specific kind of groups, ultimately replacing all the dietary characteristics that are kind of hostile to sperm, you'd not only remove the stressors that threaten sperm production, um, but it would also, it would be enough to supply your body with, you know, more nourishment than, than any weight loss diet or calorie restriction or, or, or cleanse or anything like that. 
Um, when we think of nutrient, you know, else when we think of nutrients, right? We think of them as like supplements or something that's a chemical, right? We think of them out of the context of food, right? And it's really important to think of food instead of thinking of nutrients because our body doesn't understand. I need more nutrients. Our body understands uh, food whenever it's uh, delivering nutrients to us in concert with all of these other nutrients that they that they come uh, it, uh, that we're used to consuming them in. So at the end of the day, the biggest thing that we can do is really try to keep it as simple as possible and eat things that you know not to sound like paleolithic diet, but eat things that we've been eating for, you know, before a hundred years ago, all the things that our great, great, great grandmothers would, would approve of and recognize in the grocery store, go for that, right? If it comes in a package, it's telling you it's low cholesterol, it's telling you it's low fat, telling you it's gluten-free, don't believe the hype. It's just marketing. They're allowed to market food that way. It's, a, it's, it's not illegal, right? You assume that these foods that they're that we're being fed are, you know, vetted and that they are, um, you know, surely it's good for us if they say it is. It's not, it's, it's all marketing. And we just have to know that that's the, the, the universal truth um, for most of the places that we, that we live in. So eat food, if you can pluck it out of the ground or hunt or gather it, um, stay away from the rest and, you know, let it, let it feed you, nourish you. The thing that about nutrition, I think that maybe stresses the hell out of people is that it feels like I've got to I've got to look at this whole nutritional profile of everything and uh, and figure it all out, but you don't, right? You can just keep it as simple as possible. But the fourth, this is just my really sexy set way to segue into stress. The fourth part of this web is 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 stress, which is a really big factor, risk factor for 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 sperm health. Um, so Ian, I want to go back to you because I know you talk with your clients a lot about a lot about stress. How is it that stress has any sort of impact uh, or negative detriment on, mm -hmm. on sperm health? Well, I mean, you know, everybody knows stress is bad for the health. They don't necessarily understand why. Um, and of course, trying to conceive and being kind of, you know, two years down the line and having done various sperm samples and possibly been through an IVF cycle and worrying about the tens of thousands of pounds that have got to be raised and, and keep your job going and support your partner, wife and all of this and the other creates a lot of stress um, and stress has a really negative impact on our body and we know that and I'd say one of the best books I've ever read that I really really enjoyed was a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Um, it is quite a scientific book but it's really fascinating because what it does is it looks at all the different systems within the body and what stress does to that and of course stress is a you know it, it's our natural human response to to um to some kind of stimulus that that's going to probably threaten us and the reason zebras don't get ulcers is because the vast majority of the time they're wandering around chewing the cud or they're mating or they're sleeping and they're not worrying about a lion chasing them all of the time we've we've ended up in a life where we've got so much stimulus so much kind of going on all the time okay when's the next meeting when's the next when's my next zoom call and it's back back to back zoom calls it's i've got to get to this meeting i've got to worry about this and and we've got instagram pinging in our face and we you know we want to watch this on netflix it's just like you know we're, we're living in a in a state where we're really quite heightened and what that does is when our bodies are stressed they shut down it shuts down um what what is seen as unnecessary functions because in a stressed state, we, we need to divert our energy and resources to, to keeping alive. Um, so funny enough, reproduction is not a high priority when your body is stressed. Your body will actually kind of shut down or switch off that side of things. And that then has, you know, naturally for a man has a very, very negative effect on, you know, his sperm quality and sperm production. Um, you know, not not to mention the effect it has on sleep and digestion and, and our immune system as well. You know, being hyper stressed is, is not going to be good for your immune system, which might then mean you know, you know, you're more likely to pick up colds and bugs and goodness knows what else. So um it's a really, really important element. Of course, the, the challenge is keeping your stress down and not getting stressed about the fact that you might be a little bit stressed. It kind of ends up becoming a bit of a weird, vicious cycle. Um uh, you know, I'm sure Ed could probably, and, and Morton could probably both expand a little bit on the science a bit more than I can, 
of, of stress and its impact on the body. But yeah, we've got to try and get it under control for, for many good reasons. Yeah, I think I think yeah, what you say, I think what you're saying there, Ian, is really, you know, you make a really key point. It, it's stress is in general just bad for our health, but why is that? Um, it's multifactorial. Um, I know when I'm stressed, I tend to put the wrong fuel into my body, I don't take the right levels of exercise. There's obviously a biological mechanism going on. <clears throat> you know, when you think about the stressor hormone, which which increases as we um, uh, as we get more stress, so glucocorticoids or cortisol, which is quite well known, um, and this affects both men and women, but it, it, it actually shuts down some of the spermatic function that's going on in the testicles. So, so spermatogenesis relies on a healthy amount of testosterone around um, in the testes to make sperm. But actually, if you're stressed, you can shut that off. And so that's one part of it. But I think it's bigger than that. I think you're actually once you're stressed, you, you don't go to the, you don't take your regular exercise routines. You you maybe drink more than you should. Um, and so. Again, it goes back to this being uh, actually a big jigsaw, and 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 stress is is it, it, once you pull the, the stress put put the stress piece in the wrong place, you, it makes it very hard to complete the jigsaw. So I think, I think you know, as you said there, it's about just trying to educate people to think around all of these factors we know impact, and then trying to support men so that they have other ways of knowing how. Okay, so this is an issue. Um, I can't avoid stress sometimes because my job is stressful, but coping mechanisms, and and I think. Right, going right back to the beginning, you know, sperm counts are going down, sperm concentrations are going down. Men are 50% of the problem in fertility clinics, but this is not something that's really been at the forefront of what we speak about for, for, for a long, long time. So um, I think we need to educate and empower men better um, so that actually prevention is better than cure. You know, having an IVF cycle is not the solution. It's actually avoiding having to come and see me in the IVF clinic at all. There was a really nice study, um, which which sort of very small data groups, but looking at stress in in, in hair samples actually of um, of women doing IVF, and actually we were seeing worse outcomes in, in women that are stressed. I think this applies to the girls as much as it does to the boys. Um, and I think it's about education, prevention, and giving men coping strategies, as well as understanding the biology. Because like anything, if someone says you don't do that, you kind of need to have something to hang that on. You need to understand why that's an issue. So it's better education. And I think it, people in my shoes should be explaining these things better to patients. But, but really, it has to happen before people come to me, because I'm at the end of the line. I'm in an IVF clinic. I'm in a fertility clinic. People kind of meeting me. We can change things. You know, 90 days, things can be changed, but not in everybody um so um yeah i think stress is hugely important our our body our body doesn't really understand our, all our body knows of stress is that there is stress they don't know where it's coming from why it's happening how irrational or rational it is uh, but our body you know that's that can be sort of come from emotional stress or anxiety our body also views stress as uh you know, a, a stressor, it right? can be a physical stressor, diet can be a stressor, all of those things that I said are typical of a Western style diet are stressors. Um, but what about technology? I think, Morton, you've probably got some good info on this. Is uh, our, our cell phones and our laptops, you know, being in that very uh, prime area, is it bad? Is it bad? Is it going to, is it causing a, a stressor of, of another, of another body? Uh, yeah, so I guess the, the byproduct of some of the technology we're surrounded by can have a negative effect. So if you look at um, electromagnetic radiation emitted from the antennas on our cell phones, we know that can be directly, uh, you know, have a negative effect on the sperm parameters. One of the very the simplest uh, studies or experiments I ever saw on that was a range of sperm samples were lined up. And then from the sperm sample, they split it in two. One was placed on top of a cell phone that to which they then made calls uh, continuously uh, during a one hour period. And the other one was just left normally at a room temperature and measuring those two across, you saw a vastly deteriorated sperm sample, the one that had been close to a cell phone. So very simple, mm -hmm. but shown a, a direct effect. And we've seen uh, similar descriptions elsewhere. So certainly our medical team, one of the first things they say is maybe don't wear your, or don't keep your cell phone in the front pocket all day long like very simple little intervention that, you know, at, wor at worst cannot harm you, right? At best will probably help you. Um, and then, you know, we also look at, you asked about laptops in that sense, it may be more like the heat exposure. If you sit and work with a laptop in on your lap during the day, right? So you can actually heat the scrotal area, which we know, which we know can also have a detrimental effect on the sperm production. 
because it would typically like to be a, a couple of degrees colder than the, the body temperature. Um, yeah, so, you know, simple interventions there can have a positive so effect. Potential. Can it just be as easy as just keeping these things away from, you know, out of our pockets or not on our laps? Yes, kind of put your, fix? take your cell phone, put it on a, a table if you're sitting at a table or put it in your breast pocket or maybe, yeah, do a, a stand-up desk, as Ian said, you know, where you then have a laptop or a computer. Yeah. You actually also, you know, you stand up and sit down so you don't compress the scroll area all day long by sitting down. Um, yeah, we know these compression shorts and sports can have a negative effect, tight pants, these types of things. So, yeah, it, it you know, certainly parts of technology can can affect it as well, but quite easily to, quite easily avoid it as well, I guess. Right here on the screen, we've got some cool little tips about how to protect your sperm. You know, obviously the list is extensive. There, we could, you know, the four of us could go on all day long about what changes we really should be and could be making, um, but we don't live in that world. And that's, that's okay, that's okay. We should be okay with the fact that it's never gonna be perfect. Uh, and once we can sort of accept that and make peace with that, uh, we can move on with making it better than it already, uh, already is. So very small changes, even just a few things, pick one thing from this screen right now, emblazon it into your mind, and let that be your one single goal until you like get really good at it and feel confident about adding another in. But it's really not about changing every single thing, um, purely because you're just going to stress yourself out and obviously make it worse. Um, Morton, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how to get tested and a little bit about Exceed? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a range of, of home tests on the market. So it's important that, you know, you do your own research and see what's what's right for you. Um, what we see on the market that exists is that some of these tests will only test for a single parameter. So that could be the concentration, for example, which we think is an incomplete picture of your, your sperm health. So what we chose to do at Exceed Health is to follow the, the WHO guidelines where you would want to at a minimum look at the concentration. So how many cells are there per milliliter? You also look at the motility. So how many swim at a certain uh, velocity and in a certain direction. So they could probably impregnate an egg and then also the volume. So those three multiplied together give something called the total motile sperm count which in uh, a lot of the scientific literature we have come across is, is shown as the, the best initial indicator of male fertility potential. Then down the line, there can be other appropriate lab-based tests like DNA um, fragmentation tests and so forth. But certainly at, that, at the home level to get an initial indicator, we would want to look at the total motile sperm count as, as we see it. So um, yeah, so we have developed a small microscopic device that uh, you can basically order or you can, a doctor can, can, can give it to you in a clinic. And then via the smartphone, uh, you place that on top of this little microscopic device and we do a high resolution video, which is then um, analyzed with the same type of algorithms that you find in advanced andrology labs and fertility clinics. Um, and then you're given an immediate result uh, back to your smartphone told whether you're in the low, moderate or optimal uh, spectrum. But then actually uh, as an addition to that, we also have a manual inspection of these samples. So we have our medical team do a visual inspection and see whether you know, the, the, the diagnosis um, led by the technology was actually correct. So you kind of get the, the best of both worlds. Um, it's also at this level where we can then go in and say, okay, the, we suspect there might be an underlying um, condition here. If you are in the, that low um, spectrum, we can send people to, you know, onwards to see someone like Ed in a clinic and they can start doing more advanced tests. Awesome, mm -hmm. cool, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to a couple of questions that we've got in the chat, um, you know, I was just sort of reviewing these and there's a, a couple of a couple of guys have kind of come on and said like, hey, I have uh, X, Y, Z sperm parameter that I've, that I've noticed. And the general question so far is what are my, what are the, what are the tips? Um, you know, the reality is kind of like what I just said a second ago, you could do, there are, there are lots of tips. There are hundreds of tips, but I'll just start by saying, my my genuine my genuine tip really is pick one thing just one thing um, even if it's from this screen um, and sort of be really honest with yourself after trying it for a couple of 
days or a week or so, be honest with yourself about how difficult it was to make that change. Uh, and what does it mean? Is it is that change, is it something that requires sort of breaking that off into like smaller parts and more bite-sized pieces, right? Or is it something that I'm really good at and I can emphasize um, a whole lot more or I can get the people in my house on board, right? So my tip um, would be, would be just that, just, just picking one thing. I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, a direct question and then I'll hand it over to you guys to sort of give your, your tips about it. Uh, my partner has PCOS, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we assumed was our reason for struggling to conceive. So I went for a test and had my, uh, poor sperm morphology on both results. Only a marginal gain, but count and motility strong on both. Just interested in more tips and hints on strengthening morphology. Do you guys have any tips on specifically morphology? I think, um, thanks for the question, Matthew. I think, you know, obviously <clears throat> with polycystic ovaries, it, it can be a combination of both things. Um, uh, not knowing the exact history there, but, but obviously it can be male as well contributing. So if you've got two parameters affecting things, then um then then obviously that can contribute if you've got someone that isn't releasing an egg reliably every month as well as having a partner where the sperm is not uh, as as normal as it could be then this does reduce the the, the threshold for, for natural conception i mean morphology is um of the of the things we look at probably the, the one that we see to be maybe the least important but it depends on what we're seeing down a microscope this is a subjective assessment um <laughs> giving you a, a a percentage essentially i mean 96 percent of sperm is abnormal that's what the who regard as normal um but it's it's those margins so if you're three to one percent normal um is that impacting if you've got very strong concentration and, and motility is good then actually people do conceive even with those tests in terms of improving them um i have seen over the over the time i've been working with men certainly heat think is um the one thing that i would say is probably the one thing that men can change um and as i say said to right, at the, right at the beginning you know to, to work out whether it's going to work for you you need to give it those 90 days to see because over that period of time of 90 days you do start to see new sperm coming along it takes around about sort of 80 to 90 days for a new for sperm to completely turn over and so just giving yourself that opportunity um uh, to change that that one thing will allow you with something like the exe test for example to do this from the comfort of your own home you don't have to come into a clinic and you can just see whether actually those parameters are beginning to change um and i think heat for me has been the one thing i've seen over the years that really impacts on, on on certainly morphology for men yeah i think i'll, I'll sort of add on on that i think obviously nutrition is absolutely key as well so mm. actually making sure you're on top of that um, and probably regular ejaculation as well. You know, I, th I think this is a, a topic that maybe doesn't get as much coverage as it should. But, but you know, I've had so many conversations with guys who say, oh, you know, I've stored them up. <laughs> I should have loads of them and, th and they should be great. The longer they're hanging around in your testicles and the epididymis waiting to come out, the more damage is going to occur. I mean, I think typically, and maybe Ed, you'll, you'll, you'll correct me here, but typically of morphology, morphological issues are probably going to be more to do with the production um but there is still going to be damage going on whilst they're stored up so certainly regular ejaculation is going to be good but yeah. i would also suggest if so so i to totally um agree with what ed says okay make some changes gives you give yourself that 90 day uh kind of uh process then retest if you get the same result then you need to go and probably get some further more advanced male factor investigations maybe looking at hormone profile maybe infection screening maybe, maybe dna fragmentation because that if you've got a partner with pcos then it's going to be really important that you do as much as you can to improve that sperm quality um you know to get it as best as possible so yeah that that, that would be my add-ins yeah i agree with that i think you know if you're only if your partner's only ovulating three or four times a year if the sperm is not as good as it can be, then that may impact on that 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 potential to to, to have a natural conception happening. And I think, um, as you say, it, it, it's if in ninety days things haven't changed for you, then it may be actually what you've been doing hasn't been the factor that's been so important for you. So it's it's looking at all of these things together and making those changes. And, and give, I think there is hope there for men. Though. I think I think that's why I talk about the ninety days because 
that it doesn't work for everyone you know it does not work for everyone we have men that go away and do absolutely everything uh, that ian's talking about there but they don't they come back and it doesn't change for everybody and i think that's that's really really hard but but if you're the one in that position you've got to kind of look at all of these things and, and not assume it's just just your partner as you said it, it can be quite misleading sometimes and, and, and the assumption often is, is that it is the woman and it, and it often isn't actually mm. i have to second guys, that very about... very strongly Ed. Oh, um uh, we did cohort analyses of men doing the, the our intervention program which is a 90 uh, 90 day program in the app and actually 50 percent of those initially classified as being in the low category were able to move themselves into a moderate category which statistically should lead to a six to 12 percent higher likelihood of conceiving per ovulation cycle and then sure there are people who will not respond and then you mm -hmm. start got to look for other things but it's hugely important to know that you can do a lot yourself um, yeah yeah what about uh, uh some tactical advice about uh staying cool down there i know that heat is a big problem uh we had another question from um matthew i'm not sure if it's the same matthew i think it probably is uh how do, how do we stay cool down there if you're generally a warm person Go commando. <laughs> it's a, it, it sounds silly, but actually, you know, if you're working from home and you're you're a naturally hot person, I mean, let's all be honest, you know, all four of us could be sitting there, you know, in our underpants and, and none of you would know. Um, so, you know, if you can, if you're working from home and you can wear, you know, or go, go without any underwear and loose, a loose fit in pair of shorts or something like that, that's a very, very simple win. Um, I think Joey, um, you mentioned uh, sort of tight lycra and things like that, you know, kind of really kind of tight fit, skinny jeans. I, I, I'm not a man that would ever wear skinny jeans. That's just to me is a bit wrong. Um, but it's like, it's that kind of sports, <laughs> sports gear that, you know, you, that my, guys might be wearing, especially if they're keen cyclists, you know, wearing tight fitted lycra that's squashing everything up and keeping it hot, um, avoiding the hot baths, avoiding the laptops as Morton's already said um you know it, guys it is time to drop the steam room and the saunas and things like that so yeah. very very simple wins um open it up to you guys what about this else you'd add? you know because we live in this modern world where assisted reproductive treatments are assisted and there's science involved and we're gonna uh, spill all of our money over to a doctor to put a baby inside it kind of seems like an easier fix especially if there's already problems uh there was a question here about um, you know, ICSI, right, which is, um, you know, where we inject the, the sperm into the egg. I feel like a lot of people probably are under the assumption that if we're having problems, it is good enough that, okay, fine, that maybe I don't have a whole lot of sperm, but they can do this ICSI thing where they suck one sperm out and, and put it into the egg and bada bing, bada boom, that's, that's a fix. Is that really a is that a is that a good attitude to have toward ICSI or is because you need ICSI likely going to uh, present other problems? I, I wonder if me and Ed might have different views on this, but I, th I think Ed will have a very balanced, sensible view. Um, no, go, well, go, I'm, I'm not going to change my view, so go for it. <laughs> well, I I, actually, I think you, you probably would agree, but my, my view is, and actually I, I've been thinking about writing a blog on this, that ICSI is not a fix for male fertility. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to put that out there and, and say that actually I feel really strongly about that because it actually makes me quite angry when I see a guy with poor semen analysis results and maybe even high DNA fragmentation and the clinic have turned around and said, well, we'll just do ICSI, that'll fix it you know well they might not say that'll fix it but but it's given the impression that ICSI is a solution now if you've got sperm that's got a high level of dna fragmentation so where you know the integrity of that sperm is poor in terms of its genetic material ICSI won't really make the slightest bit of difference because they're still just picking out one individual sperm and they can't really be 100 percent sure that the dna integrity of that sperm is is good enough i think you know before going to ICSI, if you've got poor semen analysis results, you've got to go and do all the stuff that we've been talking about and do that first and try, rather than working with what you've got, why don't you try and improve what you've got first so that you either don't need ICSI or you're then giving yourself the best chance. So um, maybe I'll put my, my neck on the line there a little bit. I don't know, what, what, what do you think, Ed? <laughs> no, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I, ICSI has obviously changed it's changed the landscape for, for for many men that have are despite every intervention they try are unable to change parameters it does 
give the opportunity um, to some men that wouldn't be able to conceive with either either naturally or with conventional IVF techniques to, to create embryos. But one of the things that's really, you know, fertilization rate, rates on average of eggs are lower with ICSI than conventional IVF. And actually as well, when you look at um, the male gametes, once it's, um, you know, once it fertilizes the egg, you, you don't always end up with a good quality embryo as a result. And that goes back to what you're saying, which is it's those marginal gains. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a cyclist, I follow cycling, uh, that sky analogy of that sort of 1% improvement with every little thing you're doing, whether it's nutrition, reducing heat, all factor into the potential to have a better sperm selected. If it is that ICSI is required, then you have a higher chance that when they select a sperm, it's going to be a better sperm. And therefore, I think it's about trying to do everything you can to, as, as Ian says, improve the sperm you're producing when you come around to treatment if, if you are in a situation where you need treatment but you know my, my hope is that this is this is a, a webinar that we are educating people about so they don't need to end up in the IVF clinics um, if we can and, and, and prevention is better than, than, than you know treatment but as I see say there's many questions on here from people who are obviously into established treatments already um, and, and yeah but I don't think you should relax if you if you know you need ICSI it should be about trying to improve everything you can to make sure ICSI has a more more a better potential to give you good quality embryos because good quality eggs and good quality sperm make good quality embryos we're going over we've already gone over a couple of minutes so i'm going to take one or two more questions um <clears throat> really quickly you know obviously we've been talking about poor poor sperm parameters and maybe things that you could do to make them better but what about things like uh, varicocele uh, can it accept or can it affect sperm health and if it does how long after it's fixed can you expect a meaningful change in your sperm health? Yeah, I, think, I, mean, I feel like we've gone in full circle with varicocele. Um, you know, for many years, these have been being repaired, you know, well before ICSI came along to try and lower the test average testicular temperature for men who have a sort of a varicocele, which is a collection of, of varicose veins around the testes and whether that's done surgically or with more modern techniques. The, the, then we move to, well, this probably doesn't change outcomes that much and now we've kind of we've got the new data again which suggests that actually it does make a difference to men um and i think that we're going to see that in the new nice guidance certainly here in the uk um you know where we will see a change the new nice guidance is being reviewed at the moment and i think varicose repair has historically been something that's not been advised um so from the 2013 guidance but that's being reviewed and i think we will see a change there with probably more urology inv in involvement which i think is good because i'm a gynecologist um, and one of the things we're not doing remotely is examining people's testicles, um, and I think we should be. Uh, things get missed. Men don't always self-examine. Um, maybe men don't know what is a normal sized testicle or what is a normal, what is a varicose seal. Um, and these things can not be seen. So I think we should be asking men to, um, to be examined when we see them, because I think it's really, it's all part of, you know, that, that general care we need to be giving the holistically to the whole couple. But, but yeah, varicose seals are important and with repair, you will see improvements. It does depend on how severe they are and how long they've been there, of course. So not everyone will, will see a fix as a result, but, but it's certainly something that needs to be discussed at, at, at consultation. And I think, you know, the, if you take a, a you know, varicose seal, if you have an ultrasound scan or that physical examination, which is so important, take that, couple that with a DNA fragmentation test. Yeah or an oxidative, well, not, yeah, and an oxidative stress test, you'll get a very good picture of whether that varicocele is causing damage to the sperm. Because the, the, the issue is, is the raised scrotal temperature that you get from that pooling of the blood. And that then can cause DNA fragmentation. And I have worked with guys and I've seen, you know, a chap that's had five, six years of treatment, several failed IVF cycles, all pointed at the woman, um, did his did a DNA fragmentation test for him, very high DNA fragmentation, simple ultrasound scan, simple physical examination, definite varicocele, um, had it repaired, and within three months they conceived naturally. Um, you know, it's not going to be the case for everybody, but if it's a severe varicocele that's making a significant difference, um, you know, a repair could make a, a, a big change. And it goes back to the 90 days. Get the surgery done, make sure you're on top of your lifestyle and diet, and, and you may see a significant improvement within 90 days. We had a question about uh, water bottles. Are, are water, bo water bottles really a big deal? Uh, do they make a big difference? And uh, if you guys don't mind, I would like to take uh, that one. It's, it's one of those things, it's like, you know, it's not a yes or no answer. 
it is a yeah kind of and a yeah for sure kind of answer right so you know cheap water bottles that are really you know very soft plastic uh, are gonna are gonna let off or gas off the most amount of you know microplastics into your water especially if that bottle has been heated or it's been sitting out in the sun um, but the question really is you know do we want to take that chance if we have the choice you know drinking one bottle of water if you're thirsty every now and then isn't going to hurt you but if you have the choice if you can put a water filter in your refrigerator you sh you really need to be doing that um because it is you know a lot of water also comes you know majorly from our from our public water systems as well but drinking if you drink all of your water from water bottles you're really uh, you know raising the raising your exposure level uh, or exposure risk. Um, so the short answer is yes, for sure. There are microplastics that are that are a huge problem uh, for sperm health and for for female fertility uh, that come from water bottles. Um, but you know, in a real in the real world, the answer is just minimize it. Try to minimize it as much as possible. Drink water out of uh, if it's going to be a plastic container. Make sure it says you know BPA free on it. Uh, or maybe it can be a, a, a metal water bottle. Um, but in most cases, you know, drinking most of your uh, water from a bottle is, is the worst case scenario. So try to just minimize that as much as possible. The I'm last question. The environment. Thank you. I wasn't going to say it, you know, I just figure, you know, we, just, we know, you know, these things. It's <laughs> for the environment too. The final question, let's talk about supplements. And well, let's not talk about it. Let's just give a yes or no. Are supplements good or bad or necessary? And what should I be taking? If you can, there's actually a supplement that matches every single vitamin and mineral and antioxidant out there. Should I be taking all of those or not? I have an answer, but I'm going to let somebody else take it. Right. I mean, I, I can, yeah, go ahead, Ed. I mean, I, so yeah, I, I, I generally encourage men to consider it, but I think you have to, you know, look at the big picture as well. I mean, I don't think a, a, a supplement is a quick fix. I think if you think that you just could just take a supplement off a shelf and then then everything will be be right. I think it's uh, it maybe works for some, but it, I, I think I worry that then you're not looking at the whole seriousness of everything. Um, so I think it, it's worth considering and it's worth doing um, to boost your nutrition. But I mean, you know, in the Western developed world, if you're putting the right fuel in your body, you're probably getting a lot of the right things anyhow. Um, I worry about the marketing around lots of different products and what's better than one better, one's better than the other. They're quite expensive. And I, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not against them. I, I do tell patients to consider them, but um, I think it's not the only piece of the, it's not the, maybe the mission critical bit of the jigsaw. I think I'd agree with that as well. I think you'll start with your diet, get that straight, work on that, make sure you're doing all you can. And then I don't think there's any harm in having a good kind of multivitamin and, and probably fish oils. Cause I think a lot of us struggle to get good fish in um, as a boost. I think one of the cautions I would suggest is, is antioxidants, just piling in antioxidants um, just for the sake of it. You know, you've got to know that you've got oxidative stress going on in the body before you do it, before you take antioxidants. Um, but yeah, I, it, diet for me, I think is the first, first port call. And then a supplement is there to supplement a good diet, not to replace doesn't mean you can have a kebab. <laughs> my my biased opinion, of course, is that you know for 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 millions of years humans have been evolving and reproducing um, by eating things that we could hunt and gather, right? Uh, and we've been reproducing just fine. And for those strains of us that 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 couldn't, you know, we we didn't continue to reproduce, obviously, because we're not here. So those of us that are here have sort of stood the test of time, and that test. Uh, was also testing what diet works the best to give you everything you need to live a life and to reproduce uh, to, to create offspring. And you know that diet is you know more fruit is mostly fruits and vegetables, mostly plants. You know if you eat meat, like try to eat more oily sea fish, uh, more nuts and seeds, uh, more whole grains, not whole grain products, but whole actual whole grains. Um, and omega-3 rich vegetable oils, right? It's a really good source of fat. So all of these things that we've been eating for most of our lives, and that's general, right? That's kind of applies to everybody. Um, yes, those are, those are where we're gonna, that's where we've been getting all of these, all these uh, nutrients from. So the supplementation thing, you know, again, it's sort of a marketing, it's a marketing thing. Um, so don't get caught up in it. But I do agree with you guys, you know, do take, you know, 
there are basic multivitamins um, that sort of help us fill in the gaps, right? We do live in a modern society. We do live in an imperfect world. So we can't expect to get all of the nutrients that we need perfectly. Um, so allow that supplementation from a multivitamin, just be allowed to be a supplement, sort of fill in gaps where you are unable to, to be perfect. But I will, my final statement is to sort of hearken what you just said, Ian, about antioxidants. Um, antioxidants are one thing that we, you know, struggle to get enough of. And it's one, it's, it's also another major threat to our, to our reproductive health, which is oxidative stress in our bodies. So taking something like uh, CoQ10, um, L-carnitine, those are antioxidants that are really, really powerful and have, there, there's so much evidence to sort of back those things up. So if you could just pick one, if it were me, CoQ10 um, and just a, a really good basic, you get what you pay for multivitamin. Bam, we did it guys. So again, my name is Joey Coppage. I'm the fertility nutrition coach. Uh, just like the, these three guys here, you know, I, I spend my time working with guys and with girls to help minimize the, um, you know, potential limiting factors that could be preventing us from getting pregnant uh, and staying pregnant in the first place and also creating a smooth experience, um, you know, going into it assisted if, if you need assisted. Um, Ed Coates, uh, Ian Stones, Morton Olstead, thank you for joining us today. Right here on the screen, you can see uh, the uh, coupon code to get 10% off of XC tests. And uh, we'll put in the chat, if anybody's still here to look at it, um, any other tips or links that, that, that we might have. Cool. Thanks a lot for joining, guys. And everybody have a thank great you. day. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody.